I'm going to start out in Luke. We're going to start out in Luke chapter 4. These are going to be familiar verses, but I'm hoping to turn you on fire. Is that a good desire? Yes. Are you as ready as I am, Dolores? I can tell. Thank you. <laughs> Luke chapter 4. Um, let's see. Jesus um, had already been baptized by John the Baptist, already tempted by Satan in the wilderness, came out victorious. <laughs> and in verse 14, it says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and the news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified to all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, and this is what it said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to sit at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he went like this. (laughs) Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And when everyone looked at him like, that was so strange. All the eyes of those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was a different day. This day, he came to announce to them everything had changed. Jesus changed everything. No longer were they looking for something to be fulfilled. He said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay? Turn with me, or you can look at it on the screen. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. This man, John the Baptist, came before Jesus to prepare the way. That's what the Old Testament tells us, that he would send his messenger before his face to prepare the way, right, for the Messiah. And Matthew 3, 2 says, John the Baptist came preaching, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some of them say, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. See, this was a new day. This was a new thing. This was news. When it says that he came preaching, that word means proclaiming, like, like, a, like a herald, like a newspaper boy crier, you know what I mean? Somebody that stood on the corner and like announced, you know, the king is coming, or the, the guy who goes before the king and says, the king is coming, the king is coming. That's what this word preaching means. He came proclaiming and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you turn over to Matthew 4, verse 17, it says... From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, same thing, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist is saying it, and now Jesus is saying it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I'm just going to go through some verses just so we are all on the same page, right? Mark 1.14 says, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Gospel means good news. The good news of the kingdom of God. Matthew 9, 35 says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Luke 4, 43 says, Jesus said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. Because for this purpose I have been sent. Luke 8, 1 says, Now it came to pass afterward that Jesus went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Remember, this was a new day. Jesus was bringing the message that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. The kingdom of heaven, what's a kingdom? Well, it's the place where a king reigns, right? It's a place, the realm where a king has dominion, can reign, right? It's his kingdom. That's what a kingdom is. So in our case, Jesus was coming to say what he did in Luke 4. 
Today is being fulfilled. I have been sent to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The kingdom has drawn near. And then he went about to every city. I must tell every city this. Everywhere he went, he went telling this. (laughs) See, I laugh because I know what's next. Lord, where do you want to go? I am. I'm getting excited. So when the time came for the disciples, for him to send out the disciples, Matthew chapter 10, turn there. Matthew chapter 10. I know you know this verse too. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. He's sending out the 12. And he says, and as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he tells them this. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Why does he follow up, preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers? Isn't that the proof? That's the proof. That's the proof. That's the proof that the kingdom has drawn near. It's when... You heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. And did you know that when you preach that, God will confirm that? So do you think we're supposed to be doing anything different? No, that's what we go out and do. We go out and tell them it's a new day. You don't have to live like this anymore. The kingdom is drawn near. You know what's great about it is like when I get close to Dolores... The kingdom has drawn near to Dolores. <laughs> because Jesus also said the kingdom is in you. <laughs> so no matter who I get close to, I can tell them the kingdom has drawn near and be confident. Because the kingdom is in me. Amen. And I'm near them. Amen. So guess what I should do? I should tell them about this kingdom. Mm-hmm. And then let God confirm it. <laughs> Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. We're entering an exciting day. Let me give you some. So we know this is what Jesus taught the disciples because the disciples did this. After this happens in Luke's account, it says that they came back. The disciples came back and they said, even demons are subject to us in your name. They were amazed. They told, they, they, it was like, it worked. (laughs) You know, they're just like us. They were just like us, you guys. Even demons are subject to us. And then Jesus says this. In case you just need to hear this tonight, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Mm, See, God isn't just a little bit more powerful. That's not the God we serve. Our God only knows how to triumph. His power is so much greater. I saw, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, I can throw pretty hard, but I don't know if I can throw as fast as lightning. But God can. And then he said, behold, I give you authority to trample over all the power of the enemy. See, this is a new day. This was a new day. And it wasn't, it was the dawn of a new day. This is what we still have today. Nothing shall by any means harm you. In the day of viruses and bacteria and threats and all this whatever they want to say out there, which Dr. Savell says don't get distracted by anything out in the world. Keep your focus on the promises. Stay in faith, right? Nothing shall by any means harm you. No thing shall by any means harm you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven because that's what gives you access to all of this, right? Go preach the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. For those of you taking notes, Luke 17, 21 is where Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So we see the disciples. It says in in Mark 16, 20, Jesus goes to heaven. They, it says, and they went out and preached everywhere. What do you think they went preaching? The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. (laughs) They went out and preached everywhere. 
the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. What were the accompanying signs? The sick were healed. The lepers were cleansed. The dead were raised. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. Those are accompanying signs to, the, to heaven drawing near. That's the proof, the evidence that the kingdom has drawn near. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it's talking about Philip, and he goes to a town, and he's preaching, and it says, And when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So here it tells us what he was preaching and that the accompanying signs were also there. By preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. See, when you place yourself in this kingdom, when you become a part of this kingdom, you've been given authority. Authority in the name. And everything in this kingdom is in you. Remember the last time I was with you, I talked about how we are not insufficient. You are lacking nothing. Everything you need is in you. The, the verses we need to be more concerned about are the ones like 2 Timothy 3.5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 starts talking about what it's going to be like in the last days. And 2 Timothy 3.5 tells us there are going to be those who have a form of godliness. That means a form of devotion to God. It looks like they're devoted to God. From all appearances, they seem to love God, but deny the power of the devotion to God. We are all supposed to be walking with power because it's in you. It's in you. Say, it's in me. The power is in me. It's in you. It's in you. And it takes meditating on it we can't get so distracted in this life that we're just busy 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 and never thinking you can get in your car and turn on the radio and listen 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 go home listen 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 to messages listen to this and that's all great it's all great get the word in you it makes a difference however you still need quiet time because you personally need to hear from god I have to hear from him. I have to hear from him for the things I need to know personally on a day-to-day basis. Jesus, it says, got alone with God. He would go by himself to pray. Why? To get instructions. To know what to do any day. To know who was going to come. His God would, I mean, we've heard from various ministers. You, you've heard them online, I'm sure. People that God tells you somebody, some, that shows you a face of someone you're going to run across that day mm. and what to do. Mm. But that's not going to happen if you're not alone with him. Right. If you don't get quiet. Because mm. instru- the kingdom is in us. And God is sending us somewhere to do something yeah. today. Oral Roberts said there's a miracle coming your way every day. Because the miracle's in you, and they're coming for it. Amen. So you can be ready, or they can pass you by and find their miracle somewhere else. But their miracle was in you, because the kingdom is in you. And so we have to be prepared to preach this kingdom. Jesus changed everything. He changed everything. We have to be skillful. That's pretty much what, past, what um, Dr. Savelle was saying on Sunday, is you have to know the truth, and you've got to get skillful at it in your own life, in your own life. That means when you pray about something and you feel led that way and you do it, and it goes great for a while, and then all of a sudden... It's like, oh my gosh, I must not have heard from God. No, you heard from God. So war. Do you you see what I'm saying? You can't just be, you you can't think you're wrong because the devil is coming to attack. A thief doesn't come to steal something from someone who has nothing. 
So you have to fight. You have to fight. So you take the word that you knew. Let me give you an example. So if you're a parent and you pray for the right teacher for your kid, and you're like, oh, I just, yes, this is the right. You start the school year and you're like, I know this is the right teacher for my child. And they go to school and all of a sudden they start having problems in one of their subjects. Do you, what, what is wrong with this teacher? Is, is that what we say? No, we shouldn't because we have the goods. If the teacher is struggling with your kid, but you knew this is the teacher for your kid, then what do you do? Pray for the teacher. We have weapons that are not carnal, but are mighty in God. So we use them skillfully, skillfully, right? We don't let anything come against us and then just think, throw your hands up and like, well, I guess there's nothing I can do about this. Or I guess it wasn't the right teacher. Or I guess this wasn't the right house. Or I don't guess this wasn't the right job. And what, because somebody was mean to you, it's not the right job? Why don't you practice what we preach? Right? This is what we do. This is what we do, Christians. We be Christians. We grab hold of the anointing. Christian, anointed one, and we war with it. Dr. Savelle, I, I don't know if he said it on Sunday, but I wrote it in my notes. No, I wasn't here, but I was listening online. And I wrote in my notes, nothing in this world changes the word of God, but the word of God can change anything in this world. So we take the word of God and we're skillful with it. Just like saying the verse we just sang at the start of the service. You become skillful. You speak to your situation. You know, Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, and the rest of the Bible, right? It says one time, I think, what did, what, I mean, those of you that were at the minister's conference, one time it says believe, three times it says say. What are we saying with our mouths? We have authority in the name. What are we using it for? Complaining? Working against the teacher, the boss, the pastor? <laughs> what are we doing? We need to be skillful, skillful with our words. That's part of our weapons. We are made in the image of God, the creator. Guess how he created? Words, words. Business owners, you need business? What are you saying? What are you saying? Everything you put your hand to do prospers. That's the truth. Apply the truth. Every day you wake up and all day long. Everything I put my hand to do prospers. Thank you, Lord. Your word says, and you cannot lie, everything I put my hand to do prospers. Everything I put my hand to do prospers. I prosper. I'm so prosperous. I'm progressing, advancing. I'm getting promotion. I'm seeing my highest expectations fulfilled. Amen. You take the prophecies and the Bible says you wage a good warfare according to the word. So we practice. We meditate on it. We preach it. That means proclaim it. Go around. Go out there and tell them. It's so easy to say Jesus changed everything. You know, they have, a, they have great views on religion, but Jesus changed everything. <laughs> it's not religion anymore. It's not you earn it anymore. You know, I was, I was, uh, I'm so off my notes. Sorry, I keep looking at them as if I want direction. But yesterday morning, in my quiet time, in my prayer time, I saw, I saw something. I saw something. And I saw, I saw Old Testament. I saw Remember that guy? Remember how they put the ark on a wagon and they weren't supposed to have it on a wagon? And it started to fall off the wagon and that guy reached to try to touch and he, what happened? Died. He reached out to touch the ark, the presence of God, and he died. 
Right after I saw that that happen in my mind, I saw the woman with the issue of blood reach out and touch the hem of his garment. See, the new covenant changed everything. Now we can touch him. (laughs) It changed everything. He changed everything. He changed everything. Where we couldn't go into the Holy of Holies, Dolores, the veil was torn, and we get verses like, come boldly to the throne. Jesus changed everything. Everything. He changed everything. (laughs) It's a different day. The kingdom of heaven has drawn near. It's totally different now. It's different. (sighs) See, we get verses like Colossians 2.15 that says, having disarmed. If you're a military person, I'm pretty sure you know what that means. For the rest of us, we might be slow on the uptake. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Having disarmed. Have you ever seen, like, one of those funny movies where somebody's holding a gun on someone and then they get the gun from them and and they look so stupid? Like the person that was holding the gun kind of looks like a fool, right, Tommy? Yeah, it's like they just take it. I mean, who takes The gun has bullets. Like, you shouldn't be able to take it. But Jesus disarmed. He took their arms, their weapons. He disarmed them. That's why he could say, behold, I give you all authority to trample over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Follow that up with John 16, 33, where Jesus said, I've told you all these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. Say confidence. 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 He wants you confident. In the world, you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. Yes, it's so true. It's true. But be of good cheer. That means, yes, there's frustration, but don't be frustrated. (laughs) Yes, there's frustration, but be of good cheer. Take courage, be confident, certain, certain, undaunted, undaunted. No matter what health crisis comes your way, you are certain and undaunted. Certain and undaunted. Why? Because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. In the Amplified, it adds this. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's why it says the battle is the Lord's. He's conquered it for you. I have deprived it of power to harm you. Is that the word of God? Am I the only one in here excited that the word of God just told me that the world is deprived of power to harm me? Y'all, we have to respond. We have to respond to God. We have to respond to the Spirit. If you want what he has, if you want the goods, you have to respond. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> See, when, God, when Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven has come near you, we, it, it became a day of choice. We could decide to live another way because we could get a king. We, we had a choice, Right? In this choice, Joseph, we choose who we submit to now. We're no longer a slave of sin. That's not our boss. We choose who our king is. And everyone in this room already probably chose King Jesus. Right? So then he, I chose that he reigns in my life. So I choose for his power to reign in my life. And that means when anything other than than God tries to reign in my life, I say no. No, absolutely not. No, no. mm -mm. You know, I'll say this is holy ground. This is where God, I'll tell you what, today I'm putting my notes together. I'm putting my notes together today. And I get done and I put them all together and I start to pray. Oh, I just start to pray because, you know, I want to hear from God. Final things, you know, notes are all pretty and stuff. But if God has anything else to say, I want to hear it, right? So I just start to pray. And out of my mouth, I hear myself say, God, I want you to reside and preside. I don't want him just in me. I want him to preside in me. 
I want him to reign in me and through me. I'm not satisfied just knowing he's there and I'm going to heaven someday. I'm supposed to preach that the kingdom has drawn near and I'm supposed to lay hands on the sick. Mark 16. Right? Raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons, speak in new tongues. That's mine. That's the rights I have in this kingdom. Those are benefits to me in this kingdom. And that's how when you, he will confirm the word. That's why he put verse 20 in there. And they went everywhere preaching. And he confirmed what they were saying with the accompanying signs. See, he will give the proof. You just preach it. You proclaim it. You're the one who comes before the king. There's a verse that says he sent them out two by two. He sent them out two at a time. And it says where he himself was coming. I love that. It's like we go in front of him saying what, he do, what he's done and what he will do, and then he comes behind us doing it. And he wants you certain, undaunted, confident. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take practice. Because the first few times you do it, you're not too certain. <laughs> you may not be too certain. I'm hoping you're certain, but you may not be. So you just got to practice. And then you don't stop. If it doesn't happen, is it the word of God or not? See, it's not the word of God that doesn't work. It's us that doesn't work. It's I, me, who doesn't work. I have to renew my mind to what it says. And I don't know about you, but I couldn't show, shoot free throws the first time I tried. I had to practice. I had to get good at it. And I had to believe that I could do it. Hello. Hello. So you have to get into these verses that I'm giving you tonight. You have to put them on your bathroom mirror. You have to put them on the kitchen fridge. You have to go around your house reading them. And you can't spend your time watching crap on TV. (laughs) Or the news. Because if you're going to get in fear, you're going to be double-minded. And we know from the word also that to be double-minded makes you unstable in all your ways. This is, this is the day, and I know we're all feeling it. I know you are. I know you are because I am to press in, to press in, to clear the clutter, to get it out of the way. The Bible says the kingdom is like leaven. If you let it in, it will just spread. But it also says the kingdom is a seed, is like a seed. But how many of you know from the parable of the sower, the seed needs some good conditions? A seed will do everything it can to grow. So the kingdom's been in you. The kingdom is in you. It was in you the day you got saved. That kingdom was placed in you, everything you needed. But if you've got cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, if your heart is hard in some areas because you're still mad at God about, you know, what he did in 1992, (laughs) guess what? The kingdom's not spreading and growing like it should be because it's a seed. But it will do everything it can to try to grow. In the Bible, Jesus said it's like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. And when you plant it, if you will let it grow, it will become a tree so big that the birds will come nest in the branches. That means you'll touch others, not just you. You'll provide provision for others, not just you. Jesus changed everything. (laughs) But we have to let God reign in our lives. Like, I have to let him reign in my life. So that goes to every, like, sermon we've been hearing. You've got to die to self. It's like, seriously, you guys, nothing I want is as good as what God wants to give me. You know what I'm saying? But you just have to sit down and start talking to yourself like that. You have to, like, think to yourself. If, if I don't ever sit down and talk to myself like that, I don't come to that conclusion. I keep thinking, well, I want such and such. And it doesn't occur to me that maybe God wants that for me, too, and he knows how to get it faster than I do. Because <laughs> he's good like that. He says, we learned on Sunday, too, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He will. 
So I have to let him reign in me and over me. Like, I can't expect for the kingdom of God to flow out of me if I'm not in it myself. If I'm not under it myself. If I'm not letting God reign over me. I've said it in here before. But how can I ever expect to walk in authority if I'm not under authority? Now, I can try to walk around and be the big boss, you know. But natural power only goes so far. Supernatural power is amazing. So if I want to walk in that kind of power, I have to be under that kind of power. You know what I mean? And that's the only thing that matters to me right now. If I want my highest expectations fulfilled, I think a great highest expectation fulfilled is he healed them all. Does it get any higher than that? I would like for that to be all of our expectations this year. How about everyone you lay your hands on gets healed? Is that a high enough expectation? I say we all believe for that. Can you imagine if we were all, all doing that? We can. We will. We are. We are. Can we settle on we are? Present tense faith, we are doing this. We are doing this. We are laying our hands on the sick because the kingdom is in us. The kingdom has drawn near. Jesus changed everything and he said to do it. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. If you just take that one verse and meditate on it until it becomes so real to you, then you will do it. Let me show you what this looks like. So what, happens, so what happens when the kingdom comes near them? We know from Matthew 10 what happens, right? The sick are healed, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, the demons are cast out. And that happens when we preach the kingdom. We have to preach the kingdom. We have to preach that the kingdom is here. We have to preach this new day, this scripture fulfilled, what Jesus came for. We have to preach it, and God will confirm it with these accompanying signs. Let me show you what it looks like in Luke chapter 5. This is, this is what it looks like. Oh, man. All right. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, verse 3, and asked him to put, a little, put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the multitudes from the boat. So what do we think he was teaching? The kingdom of God has drawn near, right? He was teaching them about this day, the scriptures being fulfilled. He was teaching what that meant. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon, the professional fisherman, answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. Why do I say this is what it looks like? Because this is what it looks like when the kingdom's drawn near. When a power that's not natural becomes natural. When something so totally out of the ordinary happens and they know it without a shadow of a doubt, there is no way. I've never seen this. I've never heard anything like this. Why do you think Peter fell at his knees? He had, he had been fishing his whole life. He'd never seen anything like this. It was so totally out of the, the known, out of his imagination, that he knew it was something extraordinary. And what did he do? He immediately left all and followed him. That's what this looks like. This is what it's going to look like. When you do your part and God shows up and does his part, just like God did here, Jesus preached, God met with the accompanying signs, they are going to know without a shadow of a doubt it was him. 
Remember the story in Gideon from last time? God was like, they are going to know that it's me. You can only take 300. Remember they each had to kill 450? (laughs) So outside of the possibilities in the natural that they will know it was God. I love that. I love it. And then later, Peter saw a power at work that was greater than his and greater than anything natural. He immediately left and followed Jesus. And then Jesus taught him how to do it, showed him how to do it. It says in one of those verses, let me go back. It says in Luke 8, 1, now it came to pass afterwards that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. So they were hearing him do this. They were watching it. They were hearing it. It, Philip even knew to do this in Acts chapter 8. So obviously it had been taught to them. Peter, having seen all of this, watched all of this, heard all of this, experienced all of this, later he was a part of this when it came time. Remember that guy, that lame man at the gate? It was like Jesus, this was like the first miracle after Jesus leaving. And yet somehow in them, they knew. Remember when the Holy Spirit came? It changed. He changed everything. He changed them. Where else do we see Peter and John walking together, not arguing? On their way to church, right? Working together. And they get there, and they have this lame man, and they raise the lame man. They heal the sick. That's what Peter did with what he learned. And then it says later, I didn't write down what verse is, But it says they would lay people out in the street that the shadow of Peter. The kingdom is in you. The kingdom is in you. And as you walk by, so does the kingdom. What are you saying as you walk by? What was Peter saying as he walked by? That they would have faith. They can reach out and touch you. You, they can reach out and touch you because the kingdom is in you. You can reach out and touch them because the kingdom is in you. It says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, that he always leads us in triumph. And he manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place through us. Through us, that sweet aroma of the knowledge of him can be loosed everywhere we go. That they would know him. Let me read you those verses. I I want you to notice how many times. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. (sighs) Philippians 3. Philippians 3.10. My determined purpose in the Amplified. (laughs) And then I'm going to read you something in John. My determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately, progressively, progressively, it's progressive. That's why we have to practice. It's progressive. You will know him progressively, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. 
see, that changed everything. It changed everything. But we have to know it. And it's important that people know it. That's why it's important that everywhere we go, the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place that we tell them and release that sweet knowledge of him in every place. Habakkuk 2.14 and Isaiah 11.9 say, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wouldn't you say that's completely? The waters cover the sea completely. And there's going to come a day that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord fills the earth. Why? Because we're all preaching the kingdom and God's working the accompanying signs. And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of him in every place. I just want to get this in, so I'm going to. I'm just going to. But in first, I mean, in, um, good thing I numbered these pages. First John 5. John, the disciple John, who was very close to Jesus, calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how close he thought he was to Jesus, right? He writes this in first John 5, 11 and 12. And this is that testimony. And that testimony is the testimony of God from the previous verse. So this is that testimony, meaning this is the testimony of God, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who possesses the Son has that life. He who does not possess the Son of God does not have that life. First, let me point out that it said God gave us this life, past tense. And then it says, he who possesses the Son has present tense, that life. You presently have that life in you, already given to you. Verse 13 and 14 says, I write this to you who believe in, adhere to, I'm doing amplified, trust in and rely on the name of the Son of God. So if you don't adhere to, trust in, and rely on the name of the Son of God, then you need to take some quiet time until that name becomes everything that you trust in, adhere to, and rely on anytime something comes your way. You immediately respond with the name. The name of the Son of God. I write, to you, I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in the peculiar services and blessings conferred by him on men, so that you may know, know, with settled and absolute knowledge. Does it sound like he wants us to know? With settled and absolute knowledge that you already have life. Yes, eternal life. And this is the confidence. 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 The assurance, the privilege of boldness, the Amplified says. So if we're not bold, what do we need to do? Get in this word until you have a privilege of boldness, until you know it are certain, undaunted, absolutely settled, and you have a privilege of boldness, which we have in him. We're supposed to have this in him, this privilege of boldness. We are sure that if we ask anything according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and hears us. And since we positively, positively know, I positively know, like I can know something, but when I say I positively know, I mean, it's almost like, you know, a double negative. I positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask. We also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possessions the requests made of him. I bring this up because I'm going to show you an example of what this looks like that Jesus himself gave us. In John chapter 11, we have a story of a much-beloved friend named Lazarus. 
And Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick and he doesn't go right away. And by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead, dead, been dead for days. In fact, his sister, he's, he's like, roll away the stone. And his sister's like, Jesus, he stinks by now. So we're talking, you know, a couple of days. So he's been in the tomb. And li- listen to what Jesus says in verse 41 and 42. He says, take away the stone. Martha says, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That means Jesus has already asked. He has already asked. And he says, and I know you always hear me. Isn't that what John told us we're supposed to And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. So John just got done telling us that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know positively that he hears us, then we know we have the petitions granted to us. Did Lazarus raise from the dead? Did Jesus ask according to what Jesus said? Yes. That's what that looks like in real life. That's how it looks like for us, is we ask. The Bible says the kingdom, the greatest in the kingdom has to become like a child. Children ask. They simply ask. I mean, they'll ask for the big stuff, won't they, Summer? I mean, you, you can have a car and say, Mommy, can I have that car? Yeah. They'll ask for the big stuff. They're on, they don't care. How, they don't know how much it costs. They're not reasoning in their mind whether or not God can do this. They will simply ask for it. Isn't that awesome? So to be the greatest in the kingdom, we just have to be like kids. Just back it down. (laughs) Adults, right? We have to get back to like just, my gosh, my daddy can do anything anything like the song we sang he only knows how to triumph and I believe that it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what report they give you you're that's your God he only knows how to triumph somebody is picking on his kid how did you feel when someone picked on your kid especially when the provisions have already been made and he's trying to lie to you I mean, oh my, I told my son, I hate lying. I hate lying. I hate being lied to. We should hate being lied to. Because there is a truth that is mighty. And we shouldn't settle for any lies that come our way. Our God is mighty. And the kingdom has drawn near. <laughs> And then Jesus said this. In case you need or I need more motivation. They asked him what's going to be the sign of the end of the age. And he gives this whole long deal of like not great stuff. Earthquakes and, you know, fights and wars. And that's just the beginning of sorrows. People will deliver you up to be killed. You'll be hated by all nations. Many will be offended, betray one another, hate one another. False prophets, lawlessness will abound. The love of some will grow cold. It's enough to make you cry. Like, no. And then he says this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, will be for, and this good news of the kingdom He just got done listing like, I mean, I don't know, I didn't count them, but like 15 bad things. And then he says, and this good news of the kingdom, I had to like go back and say, what good news? And it was verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Most people look at that verse and they think, oh, it's going to be tough. I have to endure to the end. If that were true, that would not be good news to me. But Jesus said it was good news of the kingdom. 
So obviously we're looking, anyone like me is looking at that verse wrong, right? That's not how we should be looking at that verse. So I kind of looked it up. I went and I looked it up. And it means this. For believers, you can only endure. Remember, you're not sufficient in yourself. But with God, you totally are. You are more than enough. Remember that verse that said, I am, I am equal to the task? Do you guys remember when I spoke class? <laughs> Should I bring it up? It was an amplified version, and it was, you know, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am equal to any task with God. I am equal to anything, Right? So this thing that says he who endures to the end, it means for a believer, it's he who endures by God's power. But guess what? You have to access it. It's in you. But you can decide to go get your pillow and cry in your bed if you want to. You can. That's your choice. Because it comes down to what you believe. What you are certain and undaunted about. And it could be that you're certain this is not going to go well for me. Or you could be certain that he's my God and I will prevail. Hallelujah. That no darkness will prevail against me. So he who endures by God's power, because the kingdom's in me, I can access it. I have everything I need to be successful. In fact, I can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen. He who endures by God's power to the end will be saved. Saved means delivered out of danger and into safety. Hallelujah. And it doesn't sound to me like you have to deliver yourself. I think God will just do it. But this is what got me. I love word pictures. I'm kind of a symbolism. Like, you know, I always liked that in literature in high school because I'm a nerd. So he who endures to the end will be saved. So when it says he who endures by God's power to the end... When I looked this up in the Hebrew, this in the Greek, in, to the end, the end was like a word picture. It gave you a word picture. And it was like, you know how um, in, back in the day of ships, they had telescopes and the telescope went like this? You know? So it stretched out, stretched out, stretched out, stretched out. That's what this means, to the end. So yes, you're going to get stretched. You are. You're going to get stretched. But don't you want to walk in the power? I want to get, I want to walk progressively in more power. So I'm willing to take whatever this world throws my way so God can take it and turn it into good. We sang that tonight too, right? Because you don't know what you're capable of until you're up against it. You can do this. We can do this, church. We can do this. Anything the devil presents to us, we can match it and go greater. Why? Because our God isn't just a little bit greater. So we're getting stretched all the way until that telescope is all the way unfolded to full strength, full capacity, and full effectiveness. That's where you're going. That's where I'm going. I am going to endure to the end until I am at full strength, Full capacity, full effectiveness. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Amen. Let's do this. Yes, Let's do this. Let's preach the kingdom and let God work the accompanying signs. Yes. The power of all of us doing this together, oh my gosh. Maybe, you know, I really think that's why we have the ping pong balls. Because we have to be cognizant to have these conversations. And pastor's trying to put this before us to get us to have conversations. If we will just open our mouths and tell them what we know. Just tell them what you know. That's enough. What you know is enough. God can work with anything you know. So just tell them what you yourself know. Give them your testimony, what he did for you. Surely there's something. Tell them what he did for you. That's enough. And then you plant that seed in them, that kingdom, that seed of the kingdom. It's amazing. And when we're all doing this, cognizant to spread the good news, you know that verse, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good? That's us with, those, that's us with our conversations. We're going about doing good. 
healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because we're so done with people being oppressed by the devil. So done with that loser winning in people's lives. We are here to make winners in life. That is what we do. That is what we are all about. So we have to have conversations. Thus the ping pong balls. Pastors just trying to get us to be the church that we already are. So we have to get out there and we have to tell them and then expect God to work the accompanying signs. Tell them what they can expect and then let God do it. Amen? Amen. So the knowledge of the glory can fill the earth like the waters cover the sea. Oh, my gosh. Get get that picture in your mind. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for reminding us of this. Thank you for bringing it out of the word, of the black and white, and making it real to us, Father. Help us to be cognizant to share the good news of the kingdom. There is nothing, Father, that you can't do. And there is no one who can't touch you. (laughs) They can touch you. Father, help us to have the words, to open our mouth, to just be obedient. Father, you said that we would open our mouths and you would fill it. So, Father, we simply put our faith in you that you will do what you're telling us you will do. That you, Father, your heart is toward people and so let our hearts be toward people. Father, as we purpose to have more and more conversations, as we sow seeds of the kingdom, as we tell people the difference Jesus you made and Holy Spirit you made in our lives, Father, I thank you that you will confirm it with healings and miracles and salvations in Jesus' name so that your glory, Lord, can fill the earth, that that they would all know you, (laughs) progressively come to know you and how good you are and your plans for us. Father, be glorified this week by everything we say and do. Father, let us, let our hearts be that you would reign over our mouths, over our eyes, over our faces, Father, over what we do. Father, we, we sang it tonight, we just want you. And we know you just want us and you need us. So, Father, we purpose to bring ourselves under your reign. Let your fruit be evident in our lives that people can partake of your divine nature. Father, we leave this place knowing that the kingdom is in us, that we are anointed to do the work. We're equipped for it, and we purpose that we are blessed to be a blessing. So, Father, as we walk out these doors tonight, I pray for divine appointments. Open our eyes, open our ears, and give us boldness, privileged boldness to share about the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.